you the fastest available verbal excursion to the 21st century brain. Jan's relentless verbal barrage points to the possibilities of a potential individual assault on your own personal powers that be. A symbolic romp in, around, and through the literal world. The bane of Barca Lounger thinking and the enemy of the complacent neuron. Not to be taken for any kind of psychological or medical advice. Picking up woofs and weaves from the last few nights. Some things I already brought up in conversation with you people. So I decided to go ahead and sketch it in some more. So I invented something while I was talking to you Friday. And as luck would have it, I even remember it since Friday. <laughs> I decided to call it the In Media's Raised Loop. <laughs> The best I recall, the phrase got into some fairly known Western usage in media's rays was an old, if I remember, at one time was a stage direction. What it means is to come in in the middle of the action. To pick up an example I just made up as fast as I was talking Friday, that is a great one. I could have made up others, but I already started this. And look at it as being an example of my in media's raised loop. Let's use what appears to be, or what is, television news broadcasting. Now I could have made up another example inside of broadcasting. All of you should be able to see, you could take almost any activity in which humans involve themselves and do this. But this was just one that I hit. Let's start off with a loop and referred to it as the parent corporation. You know, the NBCs, the CBSs, the networks. And let's start the loop around this way. From there to the assignment editor in the news department, all right? And there, to the reporters that work for the network. Then, to the producer of the nightly news show. Then, to the broadcaster, the anchor men, anchor women. People that actually read the news. Then, to the good old public, which is watching the news. But I want you to see what this amounts to in life. And then, what it is indicating, what you can see would begin to be a living exposition on matters that apparently are very complex in the city, which of course is just the opposite, because they're not complex enough but that appeared to be very closed, very open to great discussion, and that the final truth, the final solution that people are seeking when they consider these affairs are always just out of reach. As that great philosopher Jim Reeves said. In a loop, and I repeat one more time, I could make up loops I'm not going to make it a challenge, but I assume all of you would believe me. If right now, if I just right, name something and you hard out baseball or sports in general, professional sports, or you hard out religion, or you hard out education, I could make up something like that about as fast as I did that one. And once you begin to see it, you could too. It might have more or less. I could have, as I said, and here I could have done more and less. But here's what I want you to see. That there would apparently be, and it's not just lineal, but if I'd been scooting past this for another reason, I might have just given it that kind of sketch. But look at this way. I'll start at what seems to be 
the parent corporation, the people in charge, you're going to turn on the CBS Evening News, getting it at whenever you do in your city, 6.30, 7, 7.30. You would think, all right, the network starts. Then there's a news department. I left that out. They got different departments. But let's get down into the news department. There's the assignment editor. Whenever he gets to work, noon, 10 in the morning, he starts looking over things that he has information, press releases given out, trailovers from the night before. It's up to him, I'm going to make this fairly straightforward, we'll assume it's one person, it's up to him or her to pick out reporters and say, you go here, you go there, he makes phone calls, takes phone calls from Europe, Asia, where they've got other people stationed, and he says, right, you go and cover Premier so-and-so is visiting there in Beijing, go over there and see what's happening. Then, see, so that's what tied the reporters. Then the reporters, they get all the news together and whatever the cutoff time is, they've got to get it back to the producer. And I'm using the producer as just a catch-all phrase, is he is the guy or girl that's responsible for what goes on the air that night. So all the reporters come in, he has to have it all in. They've got to turn in their stories, their lack of stories. They've got to report to him by X o'clock. So then he sits and he decides, all right, with his stopwatch, and he turn, you know, goes through all the stories and then what will fit. So he decides. He turns it over to the broadcaster, and again, making it fairly straightforward that we'll assume this guy or woman doesn't even have to write in the stuff. Then he or she reads it out on the air when the show comes on. Then the public watches and listens and gets the news of the day, right? But then is a complete loop. Now, with ordinary consciousness, old intelligence, and of course, not ever seen, having seen an in media's raised loop since I invented it. That sounds rather made it up, doesn't it? Since I invented it. <laughs> or would it sound better since I discovered, no, invented. Discovery, you can kind of stumble around and do it while drunk. Invented, it sounds like, <laughs> an inventor sounds better than a discoverer, right? All right, since I made this, since I invented this, I'm going to specifically try and get you to see how this was connected with some more things I brought up for the last two nights. One, how there is no one truth, but parallel truth. There is no one conclusion for anything or any things, but a multiplicity of conclusions. And an older map, that I'm sure all of you still remember, that from some view, everything's true, but none is from one. Now using this diagram, and, of course, using what you can make out of it yourself. You should see, once I begin to point it out, that if we jump into this loop, in the spirit of its very name, in media's rage, in the middle, anywhere you fuck, anywhere you want to, just <laughs> jump right in, <laughs> and you can apparently move in either direction and it'll make some sense. They're tied together, such as, let me figure out the easy one maybe first. Let's start with the assignment editor. All right, he's connected to the network because they hire him, right? If he continues, if he sends out reporters, once he's hired, that every day he sends out three-fourths of the network's reporters throughout the world he tells them if there's any kind of cook-off today there, any kind of baking contest, or if there's a chef there in town that's got a book, that he's, day in and day out, he sends at least three quarters of their reporters to cook, to cover anything having to do with cooking. Now, especially if it's a cook-off, a contest. <laughs> Let's assume, I think it'd be safe, that within a matter of days, the network is gonna be very inclined to pink slip this joker, right? <laughs> but now let's look at this way. He is also tied to the reporters. He has to have some knowledge of who the reporters are. He finds out that there is. They're down to the point of needing a few human interest stories, and he finds out there is. Don't make me make up something real Rococo, which I can. <laughs> Let's assume that he's looking for human interest, and there is some little tidbit he heard about that's going to be going on today in Beijing having to do with cooking. <laughs> there would be, be good for a minute or so on the news right then. And he looks down at who their man is in Beijing. And he realizes, he knows the guy, he used to work with him back in Dallas at a station or when they were both with Associated Press. And he realizes sending him out to cover a cooking thing, you know, 
It's a waste of time. He will not come back. I, I just know him. You know, I've been drinking butter his for 20 years. And so he knows who to send to what stories, right? More or less, he knows that some people will not come back with a certain coverage of a certain kind of story. All right, so you can see, I just picked that out, that they are tied, that there is even a reasonable connection. But back at the ordinary level of old intelligence, if people tried to plug into this loop, that is, guys are sitting around at a bar talking. Academics are sitting around on some panel at a school of journalism somewhere, at a university, discussing TV journalism. Where goest thou in the 90s? Or some, something like that. <laughs> and the subject comes up. The moderator says, well, let's discuss how important is the power of the assignment editor. In fact, is it too important? I'm just making it up, of course. So they start discussing. More or less, they would fall into this loop. Trust me, they would. They'd begin to discuss, probably first off, the power he has to assign certain people to certain stories. And they would get into discussions about, well, I know so-and-so at such and such network, and he is of such a political liberal bent that every time there is a conservative-based story, something that would make the conservative parties here in England, anywhere throughout the world look good, he will purposefully, I know he does, it can't be an accident, he will send out a liberal reporter if there's one available, and of course they come back with a torted view of the story. And so they all go blah, 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 and they discuss that a while. They would finally, though, if it, they would back up, and somebody, still them not knowing my loop, but then they'd get into, well, wait a minute, how about the pressures that the assignment in editor is under. He is the first guy under the gun. I mean, the news, the department, starts with him. The pyramid, going down, he is at the top, and then they could discuss all of the pressures on him. They would go no further. Ah, oh, somebody might throw in a little something. Well, well the network's got to make a profit. But trust me, no matter how academic no matter what their qualifications or how intelligent they seemed at the city level, ordinary intelligence within a given span of time apparently involved with questioning some aspect of some activity in the city. Once you could see that there was a loop in there that you could describe, ordinary intelligence within a given period of time, a given period of interest in some area that they have defined, will only move either forward or backward in that loop one step. <laughs> You can look at it as a matter of muscle tone, energy. It's like taking someone, and the best they can do, ordinarily speaking, we're about going to cover it, is run a marathon. People that run all the time. They, you can find people that run every day that probably can run five miles every day. But then there seems to be a limit. And I'm sure there are people that do run more than 26 miles or can at one time. But there reaches a limit to where if you're going to talk in general, you'd say nobody, no matter if they run every day, the world-class champion, they got and run nonstop, X amount of miles or kilometers is it, right? The mind, old ordinary intelligence operating within given perimeters, if you knew what they were, but it's almost what I'm trying to tell you, at any given time of one person, if you just you by yourself, or a group of people, the group of people that would expand somewhat the literal aspect of time. In other words, a group, this panel, might be able to discuss and apparently continue to say something that's, in the city sense, meaningful, pertinent to the matter longer than you could because you've got, let's say, eight people on the panel all trying to contribute to the subject of assignment editors. Too powerful in the 90s or whatnot, whatever the title was. But the thing is, ordinary intelligence whether it be in the individual or this group, generally speaking, in any meaningful way, even by city definitions, can only move either forward or backward that night, at that sitting, at that conference, one step, either forward or backward in such a loop as this. And that's it. You realize, once I tell you this, that there is no in the revolutionary sense, in a new, more complex, from a more complex view, there is no nourishing information going to arise, going to come out of pursuing a loop like this 
one step in any direction. If they could do it two steps, I'd still tell you the same thing. If they could do it three steps, you can only do it profitably when you can, not just, I'm fixing to drag it out for you a little bit, step by step. You got to be able to do that, and then once you realize that, you got to be able to do it like that, to run the full loop. I said, I pull it out step by step, you'll see what I'm going to do. I surely am not going to have to do it all. But what I just described, just because I start up here at noon on the clock, that doesn't mean anything. Except I always try to start off and seem sort of reasonable and like I may talk about something that's going to make some sense. Everybody's tired. Well, let's start, since I went in this direction, the reporters are tied to the producer. He seems to be the guy I'm using him as. He's the final arbitrator of what goes on the news that night. But it's not like he is operating in isolation because he's got to take what the reporters bring in. He may turn to his secretary. He may turn to himself or his assistant and say, most of the people, most of the reporters we got working for this network shouldn't even be in the business. But I've got to fill up 30 minutes tonight. So you can say he is tied to, he is dependent upon them. The broadcaster. Let's just say that he is one of the so-called pretty boy readers that he just shows up and maybe every night or so he wants to change may to might so that he can tell his friends that, well, I, of course, I help write some of the copy. <laughs> but let's assume that he just reads. I know that there are writers plugged in here and all that, but we've got to stop somewhere. The producer is in charge. He hands him the script a few minutes before and says, look this over, make sure no words you don't, can't pronounce. <laughs> And so you can say, well, the broadcaster, he just comes out and does his job. But you've got to see, he's tied. The producer hands him what to do, right? He hands him the script. Says, this is it for the night. All right? But it's also the other way around because he has to take into consideration, he and the writers, they're actually going to do the copy, of so-and-so. The guy may have trouble with certain words. He, they've got to take into consideration the final person that comes on the air. They could not write the same kind of copy for... Uh, you know, who are we going to talk about? Or David Brinkley, that they would for Walter Cronkite. They could, you've got to take into consideration moving in that direction also, that he is still dependent upon him. All right. Then you can say, well, that's just the public. That's on the TV, and they're just passive. The face comes on, they don't have a remote, and it's already turned the channel to, <laughs> to the CBS channel, so they're going to sit and watch the CBS news. And you can say that they're just helpless. The broadcaster says, hello, I'm so-and-so, and here's the news of the night. And you're going to sit there and take it. No, no, no. The public, then, let's run this direction for a second, tied to the network. Because you can say, well, all right, the broadcaster doesn't decide what goes on. I don't like what he does, but it's CBS. They're the ones, they hire these fuckers. They're the ones that hire all these, uh, you know, the editors and the producers. It's not just him. It's that whole network. I'm going to write a letter and complain. I'm going to tell them that I won't buy anything that a sponsor continues to support that particular broadcast. As long as you've got that guy on there and that kind of slanted conservative or liberal or progressive view, whatever they think it is. But do you see? It runs back this way. The network then is dependent. Somebody could say, this kind of thing goes on, to stay with this example, that somebody writes a letter to the president or to the paper saying, we'll do something about the stranglehold that the three networks have on the spread of the news to the American public because such and such commentator, such and such news broadcaster is obviously a dyed in the wool conservative. Or so and so at the network is obviously run by and owned by pink old liberals. And then we got no choice. We got to do something. Pass some new antitrust laws. Break them up. Do something. All right. So whoever wrote that letter, their attitude is, they're, they're in the public in this place in the loop. Their attitude is, these people have got us by the kazoos. No. They won't give us the news, and that's the best place I get the news. I don't want to fool with the paper. And so they give me anything they want to. They slant it, they twist it, and I'm helpless. No, no, no. If the public quit watching, everybody understands this, don't you? The point of the news broadcast is not to uh, disperse news to the public. The point of a news broadcast is to make a profit. The same way as a newspaper. It's not to deliver news to you. It's to make a profit. But their service... What gets you to buy the paper is the appearance that, oh, I'm going to read some news. But that's not the purpose of a newspaper. That's not the purpose of a network news show. 
The purpose is to make a profit. So if enough of these people say, boy, I cannot stand the way you present the news, up here the CEOs, the board of directors, those that got to answer the stockholders, it will take them just a short period of time if a whole lot of people write in and in fact follow through and say, we're not watching, we're not going to watch you anymore, and uh, I'm going to remember, I wrote down the last time I watched last week of some of your sponsors, and if they continue to sponsor your news broadcast, I'll never buy anything. You do understand, within a short period of time, according to how fast the public and in what mass they operated, the network and their wisdom would come right down here and they would begin, heads would roll like a bowling alley. And if enough people wrote and said the, the newscasters slanted too liberally, and let's assume that we could uh, identify these people, ask them in private or party, are you a liberal? And they'd all go, yeah, yeah, yeah. They would fire everybody there and say, go out, get William F. Buckley to do our hiring, and we've got to overcome this because we've got to make a profit. They don't care what the news is presented, right? They are dependent. They are dependent on them, the other way. The loop, that's enough examples. Can you see that if you were going to try and understand anything about what seems to be the news, the presentation of the news via the television airways, you cannot start somewhere and go from here to there or here to there and it tell you anything. That can reinforce your old intelligence. They can make someone who believes that the news is slanted in a conservative way, they could go in one direction and go, I knew it, I can spot it right there, I can explain it, that, that in fact reinforces my feeling. It doesn't tell you anything. Not someone attempting to feed, develop and feed a new kind of intelligence. Having an understanding of this, having a continuing recollection of it, should make you be able to flesh in some of what I sketched out last week of mentioning to you that there is no one truth. That is not a philosophical statement of some kind. It's not a theoretical statement. It's not a theological theory. I even hate to say some things in words such as that because it's, I just do. <laughs> there is no truth. There is no one truth. I don't blame as corny as that may sound, and corny is not it, but I don't like the sound of it. I'm having to use it because throughout history, I didn't do it, so don't blame me. It's you people's fault. You and all your forefathers and foremothers and four uncles <laughs> have been talking about for eons, which is old. That's a long time. They've been talking about that there is a truth, that there is the top of the pyramid, the truth of everything, and if not that, when we get down to the question of why is the news slanted? If we had more information, says somebody in the city, if they didn't hide it from us, if they were more forthcoming, if they weren't all huddled together up there in New York, all those pink old liberals, or all those chartreuse conservatives, or whatever they would be, we would know the truth. The truth would come out about how they sit around and slap the news every day, how they blah, 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 blah. The belief, the thinking belief in the human nervous system that behind everything that seems to present a problem, which tell me something in ordinary life that does not seem to present a problem, if not one pressing upon your thorax, at least one that seems to be open, seems to be needy for further investigation and understanding. So it's a problem. The belief, the thinking belief is that behind all of this is always an answer, the truth of why the network news is like it is. There is no the truth. There are parallel truths. Now this, you're gonna have to take my loop now and let it float out there in the 4D world while realizing it's got to be supported by at least the fifth dimension, but you've got to take that loop now and look at it as being a sphere. It can rotate in all kinds of directions, just free floating, and those could be anywhere on the sphere. <laughs> then the truth, as old intelligence would say, is uh, why, why do they keep having broadcasters on that particular network that are obviously slanted in a particular political way? All right says old intelligence looking for the truth. Well, it's obvious. They knowingly hire such people in that work. Huh. 
<laughs> so then you can walk away if you're old intelligence and somebody brings up about, you ever watch the news anymore? Not me. The networks, it's a conspiracy and they all slant the news. Ha! <laughs> now you know that that doesn't tell you anything. It's not even true because they don't know what they're doing any more than you do. But here is something I'm trying to give you a visual, visual representation of the fact even though I've got it drawn here two-dimensionally, imagine still that all of that is written around a sphere. And these words, these points where they're, I've d done this, can shift at all times. They're just free-floating on this sphere. To try and look for the truth about why the network news comes out as it does, you can go from any one point on that sphere that you think, oh, I'll start here then if you get this good, it is not really an in media's raised loop. It should be an in media's raised sphere. Because then you could go anywhere else on here or other parts I didn't plug in. I could subdivide it. And then you could go from there to anywhere else. And then from there to anywhere else. If we assume that there are a finite number of places you could go, call it X. After you reach X and you're getting to X plus 1, you would be back where you started. It would be a four-dimensional loop. Then you would understand that there is not one truth all along the way. It was all true. And as many points, as many places as you stopped that you understood, aha, I see how it's connected, there is a parallel, the truth. Not a truth, which it really is, it's a correctness. But what everyone else believes is the truth that old intelligence and you and everybody else would say, all right, the news is slanted because the network hires, knowingly hires, people with political views. Ha! And then if you walk away, you don't understand anything. You can say, right, well, that's it. I know it. But you do know that that's not knowing anything. You knew that much before you met me. Everybody knows that much. Everybody knows there's a reason for something. <laughs> <laughs> and whatever that reason is, that's the truth behind it. <laughs> but on this, if you can begin to see that there is a non-stop, there is a living, an organic, free-floating series of parallel truths, and they can be visualized. But once you see it, there's no, you don't have to visualize this. It simply is. You know that if you're going to go from one spot in your thinking to another and expect to find something, go, aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> Tut-tut -tut on you. You were doing that before you got involved with this. To go from one spot to a second spot. Or to back up and go, aha, now we're getting somewhere. Hardly. Everybody does that. You cannot move one direction, one time, in this kind of in media's raised sphere or loop and feed new intelligence. You cannot go two places. You'd be getting better, if that means anything to you relatively in the city, which it shouldn't. But it should inspire you. It should help feed you to keep going. You would have to be able to run the loop. You'd have to be able to run the sphere to every possible point, as far as you were concerned, that was of any possible importance, just whatever came to your intelligence. You would have to run through all of that and anything else that you'd plug in, which could be you know, the news department itself. Stringers, assistant reporters, assistant producers, the writers, you can do all that. It doesn't matter. But to reach the point I'm talking about to, real, to understand that there are not, not a truth but parallel truths going on coevally at all times and all dimensions, you would have to go wherever you started and run through your complete loop back to where you were. So that that which you started with finally, in a sense, explains itself. <laughs> except you had to go through the whole damn world, the whole universe to get back there. But of course, when you get good, sometimes it takes up to that long. And then you realize that there is some real validity to me saying that there is no one conclusion, but a cornucopia. Many conclusions which defies all verbal logic in the city because a conclusion seems to be, or supposed to be, just that, a conclusion. But they're not. Along the way of running through this kind of in media's raised loop or sphere 
Everybody else would go, aha, and come to that conclusion, the truth. Aha. Uh -huh. And it's not a conclusion. How long have I told you forget periods? Periods are for poets. Periods are for people who don't know what they're doing. You don't know a sentence yet that deserves a period. It's always a comma. So you can go, aha, a conclusion. But you've got to remember this. That's just one conclusion. Anybody that just deals with one conclusion is dealing with old intelligence. They're not dealing with any real understanding. Can any of you, it's been a long time since I mentioned it, how about that older map, that sketch, how all of this and what I've just said relates to It's hell to start to quote yourself and have some doubt. I know what I meant, but it was exact words. And so many of you wrote it down at the time I did it. It's from some view, or everything's true from some view, I believe is the way I did it. That is not, again, let me, before I finish the sentence, that is not some clever pseudo-Zen statement. It's not some city-based attempt at relativitist philosophy. It's a fact. It's a fact that old intelligence cannot perceive. And that is, everything's true from some view. I don't say which one, because you say which one is no longer true. But no matter what anybody says, you can say something that you don't believe, that you just say is not true. People talk to the dead and the dead talk back. Nonsense. They're flying saucers like people, they're flying saucers that come down and people talk to them. You say, never happened. From some view, from some view, everything's true, comma. But none is from one. That is, from one view, and I don't care what view, it doesn't matter. But if you've got a single view of anything, it's not true. Now, notwithstanding that you Maybe many of your learned friends, maybe the city, the majority of the city says from that one view this is true. I'm saying it's not. And you know how I say it's not, it's not, whether you see it or not. From one view, nothing's true. I don't care what it is. I don't care if you say, all right, that's a piece of paper. That's the view, that's it. We don't need more views. That's not true. That's like saying, all right, from one view, the networks are responsible for the slanted news. In the city, that's just as sane and as logical as it can be, is it not? Do we have to pursue that any further? The networks are responsible for the slanted news. Well, are you sure? Who puts the, who owns, who has the license for that channel in your city, uh, NBC? At the end of the show when it says copyright, what does it say? That this news broadcast today was copyrighted, NBC. Well, what the hell are you bugging me? That is the view. That's true. The slanted news is due to NBC. They're responsible. Case closed. Not unless you haven't been listening all night. From one view, no matter what it is, from one view, nothing is true. Now, I don't care what you fill in for nothing. That is, no matter how simple, no matter how self-evident it seems, you do not understand, you do not know anything about the subject if from one view, as far as you're concerned, all right, yeah, all right, that's true. You're wrong. Everything's true from some view. None is from some, from one. It is not possible to have one view. It is not possible to come to one conclusion about anything and it have any pertinence to new intelligence, to understanding anything. Of course, I agree, if I must, it might sound to be fairly impertinent for me to say, to say that that's a piece of paper with writing on it, and for me to say, well, if that's the only view you got, that's not true. And for you to say, well, we don't have anything else to do, would you care to explain to me philosophically why? No, I wouldn't. We're down to the point, I believe, without me trying to conjure up a new term, I'll steal one, of diminishing returns. <laughs> there are things in life that you, everybody, they're not, the point of potential profit gets to the point that you only have so much energy to devote. 
to this to being alive. So I'm not going to argue with you and try to make you see you'll be able to do that yourself. That to say that that is a piece of paper writing on it, and that that's the only view, and for you to say, well, that's true, that belies what you said, that from one view nothing is true, it does not. But if you take one view and accept it as that is the statement, that is the conclusion about that, it's suicide. That is, you're going to stand right there in the middle of old intelligence the rest of your life. You will never have any living knowledge of such things as my February the 27th symbol of the end media's raised loop. Because from one view, from one view, nothing is true. It's not correct. It is not meaningful. It's not important. If it was, everybody in the world would be Einstein's, five-dimensionally speaking. Everybody in the world would know everything. If all it took was one view, somebody said, all right, to be a good person, you should be a Christian, let's say. Everybody goes, got it. All right, got that covered. Uh, <laughs> to uh, be successful in life, always be honest. Got it covered. Or maybe they say, to be successful in life, you've got to cheat. Everybody, got it, got it, all right. Uh, Eat vegetables and you'll live forever. Got it? You'll, you'll live as long as you can. Got it, got it, got it, got it. Uh, uh, don't drink any mixed drink that has a slice of fruit on it. Okay, got it, got it. <laughs> as I expected, I elicited a few laughs, but that is what it amounts to. That if from one view, something was true in the sense that it was meaningful, that it imparted to you all that, was, that you needed to know, all that you desired to know, all that your intelligence wanted to cover that, everybody would be just big and fat and happy and smiling. We wouldn't be here. If I felt like I had anything to say, there'd be nobody in the world that wanted to listen. What do you want to hear? You've heard it all. Not only did you hear it all, as soon as you heard that one view, you said, got it, got it. I guess by what, fifth or sixth grade, there'd be no more education because they just tell you everything, got it, 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 got it. Laws of physics, chemistry, everything they tell you one time, how you should behave, everything, got it, got it, got it, got it. And that's it, right? Except for the fact that everything's true from some view, but none is from one. And of course, nobody knows that. I was going to say except me, but now you people know it. Now let me start another paragraph before we have to turn the tape over. I want to stress, I've been talking around the edges of this, but I want to stress, I can make this, I guess I'm about to, to sound in the beginning, and for the next few minutes perhaps, slightly fluffy, non-oppressive, non-threatening, but this is damn deadly serious which some of you may find verbally apropos in just a second because my opening gambit, my opening move is this, to verbally tell you for this paragraph that if in the city a matter is treated seriously, it is not. It is not serious. <laughs> In fact, from any more complex view, from any form of new intelligence, for you to be able to operate at all at a level above that, the more serious they treat it, that is old intelligence, the more serious they treat it, the closer it gets to being hyper silly. <laughs> they go far enough with it and it's just silly. This does not, if I must point out, I shouldn't, but I'll do it for those of you that worry about such things. This is in all areas except that which would be immediately life-threatening. Now, if in the city, just the dunderhead poster person for the city, if they go on TV and announce uh, that there is a deadly swarm of locusts with little teeny machine guns headed our way, you know, even I might go indoors or go down the basement for a little while just, just in case. 
If it made the network, you understand. But other than that, you understand. Other than that which really could reasonably to you be pressingly dangerous, perhaps immediately life-threatening. Other than that, I'm telling you something that is just one of those silly, well, humorous almost, realities that cannot be seen when you're looking one step at a time. If in the city, by my tropical speech, you understand I'm talking about ordinary people, your old intelligence itself, but then the city, rather than just looking at yourself, let's start out and blame it on apparently out there. I don't care what it is in the field of politics, religion, family affairs, financial matters. In the city, the more they treat it seriously, not just when I say them, the more the them expands, that there's more and more people, commentator after commentator, every night on the news, every time you turn on a PBS TV show, every other one is in this new area. Not life-threatening, but having to do with the nature of man, the nature of human intercourse, family affairs, political affairs. The more they get serious, the more and more they get serious, the closer and closer it is getting to just being outright silly. But I assure you of this, to repeat my opening statement, the more it is treated serious in the city, or if it's treated as a serious matter in the city, it is not a serious matter. That is a fact. Turn the table. Do remember that I am not an ordained minister anymore. <laughs> I like that one too. <laughs> I am not a psychologist. I am not a holdover from the psychedelic era. <laughs> I say that to remind you that I'm aware that some of these ideas that I put into sentences can sound either so straightforward so pseudo-mystical, take your choice somewhere amongst all this, so off the wall, so innocuous, as to be of no great importance, and I'm telling you, it is. To a few people, not to life, remember as always, it is not a cop-out of some kind, it is not any sort of ordinary encouragement for you to treat the affairs of life, the pressing affairs of life, as silly. You know, people can take dope, evidently, and do that. People can have congenital, ha-ha, brain damage and act that way. People can just be all around rotten people and act that way, right? <laughs> Criminal inclined people, right? There just seems to be people in life that some way will act that way. You can be sitting around the bar having yourself a little drink, and they come on, they say, and here it is, the Billy Graham Crusade, direct from Topeka, Kansas. And the same guy go, now Benny Graham, he's saying that. So you can say, well, he's not taking it seriously. That's not it. No, 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 no. He's taking it seriously or he wouldn't mock it. He has no choice. And I'm not trying to convey to my imaginary figure any kind of knowledge about what's going on. That's not what I'm talking about when I tell you that if they treat it seriously in the city as a serious matter, it is not. Only a few people can see this. You cannot theoretically see it. There's no doubt that I could get many people, not just you people, but ordinary people, if I in some way could get their attention, was making a speech or presenting some kind of BS seminar. I could start saying, well, a lot of things that people take serious in the city are not all that serious. And I could take intelligent, ordinary people, not people that could ever involve or evolve into any kind of new intelligence here in their brain while they're alive, but just ordinary around the mill people and get them to go say, yeah, you're right. We get too involved with some of the matters in the city. You know, we got to live our own lives and, you know, sh shoot, you got to have a little fun along the way. You can't just serious to death. But they still don't get it. See, they want to pick and choose. They want to take this kind of loop and move from one step to another and say, well, yeah, I think we take, uh, I don't know, the matter of, and they pick out some subject. They say, I, I believe we do take that too seriously. I didn't say a matter. I didn't say an area. I'm telling you that in the city, out there, them, and you, which that is where your city, of course, is, and you think more or less like they do, 
If they say a matter is serious, it is not. Not because I said it, but you got to see it. And if it does not have to do with your immediate health, I don't care what it is. It's not serious. And the more they say it is, the sillier it gets, if you can see it. Now, there is nothing that an ordinary person could do with this information. If in some way I got ordinary people, an ordinary person, and in some way he just fell in love with my countenance and my delivery and my great gestures, and he went, wow, that's it, I take it, I believe it, I believe it, I believe it, that is the truth. I might as well say God is love. And him go, can I write that down? Can I quote you on that? There's nothing he could do with that information. If he said, I believe it, it strikes me that that's true. That if ordinary people say something, if they treat a matter as, as being serious, it's not. God, how astounding that you could figure that out. Oh, I got to go. It would do nothing. Nothing. It is not really something that you can do anything with in the sense, well, I'm going back in the city now and take a screwdriver to most people because now I see the secret. <laughs> you knowing this is not going to change the city. But as that other great southeastern philosopher Richard Penniman used to say, good God Almighty. <laughs> <laughs> can you imagine what it will do to you to see that to how that is a continuing part of your intelligence and there's no discussion, there's no exceptions, you don't think, well is this an area wherein this, this law breaks down? My laws don't break fucking down. <laughs> if it reaches the point that it breaks down, all that means is you've gotten so good you took that law to the corner. When you get to the corner you're on your own unless I'm there and say, hello. <laughs> You want to buy some dirty new laws? <laughs> no, some filthy new laws. <laughs> um, as much as I just like, in a way, even saying this in the words, I'm not inclined to stay here long and to kick it around verbally. But there are no exceptions, and there's no way that I can talk you into this, nor would I try, but I want to point out there are no exceptions to this. If it does not have to do with a life-threatening situation, to you personally, then anything else, I don't care how sacred it seems, the discussion comes on about how we should treat our children, the benefits of education, not just for you, but for the coming generations, for your children, uh, the power, the use of financial wherewithal in your life and once you reach a certain plateau why you should help you should share your largest with others why you should be a political aware creature why you cannot be a walking around dunderhead politically that it's to everyone's interest religion I don't attack any of these things personally I just pick out the examples that are most readily seen when I'm not going into something a little more intricate. <laughs> you thought I was going to say Byzantine. <laughs> As the song says, you can't go back to. Now that's Constantinople. I'm always surprised that the damn people here are on the tape that even know any of these songs from the 20s and 30s that most of my little self-imposed bon mots, at least having to do with song titles, I notice normally just go, Psh, which is all right. The easy areas, religion, when I say easy, I don't mean that they're easy shots, but those that would seem to be the living examples. If there's anything serious in life, what's it got to be? <laughs> it's got to be religion, doesn't it? God, whatever he's called, Allah, uh, you know, the hereafter, the reward or punishment. I mean, that has got to be serious. Well, I'll tell you again, you know verbally, you've heard me put it to you in several ways, it's not to prove anything, but I'm going to tell you, 
the very ideas that they have in the city, just part of this kind of in media's raised loop that has never seen of how everything is not connected simply by one step in one direction, but how everything is connected dot, dot, dot in all directions. The very people that old intelligence now thinks back as being, let's stay with religion a second, religious heroes, the founders of religion, those are were believed to either be divine or semi or hemi divine incarnate. Those people, those figures, I'm going to tell you an absolute fact. I know it as well as I know that's a piece of paper. Just, you know I don't just say these, I'm telling you. Those very people, if they lived, let's assume they did. Moses, Buddha, Jesus, blah, blah. I'm going to tell you a fact. Here's part of that beautiful, unseen, balanced injustice. If you had been around and could sit down and they would agree to have a drink with you. And just, if I, if I convinced them, I'd say, talk to this guy for a few minutes, you know, just chit and chat. Talk on the level he wants to talk. You would, find, you would have found out that they did not take religion seriously. I don't mean in some kind of theological way of, well, it needs to be straightened out or blah, blah, blah. They would understand in their own area. Of course, they'd understand all of life is a joke. Not sarcastically. They understand that it's not serious. <laughs> but their one area, which I just picked out religion, since most people in the city would find that to be, it's got to be one of the most serious areas. I'm going to tell you that the very people that were historically in the good old, in media's rays, loop lineal intelligence, the very ones that you would think was at the heart of religion, the causes, the movers of it, I ah, sure trust me. Him. Not until further notice. Now we'll assume that you are that bourgeoisie, hoi polloi, middle class sane. I'm assuming all of you are. You should be that right now you're still going by the general genetic game plan of I like to stay alive until further notice. <laughs> okay. So that is looking after your health, your interest to stay alive. That you would heed matters that they said in the city. That this is a serious, pressing, immediate danger to your health. That. Beyond that, if they say in the city that it's a serious matter, it is not. Now, a subparagraph. The only thing the only thing that would be serious I'll go ahead and say it for a second, and you'll see why, to be able to draw this kind of parallel. But the only thing that would be serious to new intelligence, to a real revolutionist, would be one thing besides his health. Would be that which he pretended was serious. <laughs> that is important. Because it is not that there is nothing serious to somebody involved with this. There is. But it's only stuff that you pretend is serious, such as your involvement with this. You can't take what I said and start treating this non-serious. I'll throw you out. I mean, it's up to you. I don't care. But you should know that yourself. It's not just to stay in line to please me that I'm going to watch it and say, hey, you've been smiling too much. I don't like your attitude. You don't take this seriously. Get out. That ain't it. If you belong here at all, you understand that you've got to take this seriously. You've got to treat this as a serious matter, or you'll cease getting anything out of it. But let me tell you this. It's pretense. Do I treat it serious? I do. I don't go away and laugh. I don't laugh at you. I'm not using me as being the sole example for all this, as you know. But it is all to a real revolutionist, to a new level of intelligence, to get your brain cranked up above that level of the old intelligence, of city consciousness, above that level, 
The only thing serious up there is that which you pretend is serious because there's no basis for it then. There's not even the sham information, the illusionary information coming from the city now that these other things such as religion, social position, your looks, everything, that somewhere in there, there are things that you, having no recourse, you didn't adopt them, but you find them serious. They are serious matters indeed. Whether you agree with them, disagree with them, whether you think, God, I wish they weren't serious. I don't like it either way. <laughs> it's still serious. <clears throat> Up here, the land of real revolution. Nothing is serious. Who can take a virgin seriously? I don't know whether you can piece that together or not. <laughs> All right. You've lived your whole life in the city, and you finally escape, and you run out, and it is truly pristine. And you get over this hill. Of course, maybe you see me staying over there. But other than that, you don't recognize anything. It is pristine. It is singular. And there it is. Just listen to me right quick. Do you believe that you would feel very seriously about it? Like, hmm. <laughs> without the past, without memory, nothing, no one thing, no one person, no one area, nothing can be serious. It can't be a serious matter unless you have got the foundation, the baggage, the trailing smoke vapor trails of your memory, of the past, of what you already know, that is, old intelligence. Without that, whatever you see, you, there's no way you can take it serious. Not in any ordinary sense. You, you cannot. As you know, I don't try to deal in some sort of proof since there is none, but I, right quick, since I was there, could point out those of you that read enough in those kind of matters, apparently metaphysical or mystical or religious, how many people, <laughs> they, they don't know what to make about it, how many people have claimed to have seen the face of the gods, to travel places, and it almost seemed to have drove them nuts. Where they say, well, what was he like? And what was she like? And the reports from 2,000 years ago, or 3,000 years ago, back during the mythological age of people that claimed that they had slept with Zeus, or had seen Neptune in person. And they ask, well, you know, how was there? Or people that say that Sufis, that they had actually gotten danced with Allah. And they say, well, you know, what kind of guy was it? And they go, they giggle, they laugh, they go, I don't know. <laughs> now, I don't mean that's any kind of proof, but that seems to be a slight anomaly in the middle of the bell curve of most religions about how do we have some of these guys like Saint so-and-so 